Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, the Triduum, the focal point of Christian life. My main concern is not primarily the actual ceremonies themselves so much as the belief that is expressed and that will engage billions of Christians and in particular Catholics all over the world as it has done for many generations before them. I find myself also uh, equally concerned about why so many people nowadays, including f friends and family members, will see nothing special about this week, uh, even though they still want to be identified as Catholic. And it concerns me that they don't really know what they're missing. So I'd hope to do it in two stages. First of all, in this reflection, to take a sort of a long term, long range view, getting a sense of the big picture, the wider context into which these three days fit. Um, and, and touch into the underlying beliefs and convictions that they enshrine. And in a second reflection, to zoom in a bit uh, closer and look at one or two details that can throw a particular light on the main message. These three days find their origin and general shape and purpose in the experience of first century Christian pilgrims to the Holy Land. They wanted to see for themselves, to step into the world of Jesus and where possible walk literally in his footsteps and stand where he stood along that uh, way of the cross, that Via Dolorosa, which you can still do today um, in Jerusalem. And above all, they wanted to see the actual tomb, the site of the resurrection. Those early pilgrims remind us that the church essentially is still doing the same thing today. It's a pilgrim people, wayfaring strangers as the American folk song has it, making their way through life in the footsteps of Jesus, not now towards Jerusalem, but forward towards the promised land, our true home in heaven. From the beginning of Christianity, the events of that fateful week uh, in the life of Jesus were recalled, retold, passed on to others and all the, uh, the time people, disciples searched for meaning. What was really going on? What was it all about? And how did those fateful events fit into all that they had seen and heard during those heady days when Jesus had first burst upon the scene with a new vision, a new set of values, a new offer of freedom and equality and a better life for everyone. That search for meaning became more pressing in the light of the uh, growing realisation after Easter Sunday that Jesus was not dead and gone. He was alive. The journey wasn't over and done with. It was still going on and would continue wherever there were disciples. But the thing was, Jesus was still making his presence felt in new and unexpected ways. That search for meaning has been carried on over the centuries um, in a more highly organised and systematic way than in those early letters and in the four Gospels. And it has occupied the finest minds and hearts and has spilt over often into great saintly living. But of course, not everybody has got the message or picked up the meaning. Like so much else that uh, goes on in life, it can pass people by, leave them unaffected and uninterested. We know only too well from personal experience how near the truth the poet T.S. Eliot was when he said that it's a great tragedy in life when people have an experience but miss the meaning completely. And we've all probably at times experienced that. We've had to look back with regret and confess. I never realised it. It just didn't dawn on me. I wish someone had told me. One of the things that I know troubles parents today is that their children, whom they love dearly and have shared their faith with and um, introduced them to the sacraments, find that the, all of that no longer engages them or seems to have any meaning for them. It doesn't seem real. It's unrelated to their lives now as adults. 
And I've heard parents say that they're to blame and that they've perhaps failed. That's not true. We cannot live life for those we love even. The best we can do is to let them see that we found meaning in our faith and that it's that that has helped make us the people we are, loving and respectful to everybody, even where there is disagreement. Remember that old adage, faith is caught, not taught, and some people are a bit slower on the uptake than others, so parents don't give up. Anyway, years ago I came across a little book published in the 1950s by a German Benedictine nun, Emiliana Lohr, and it was called The Great Week, an explanation of the liturgy of Holy Week. The Great Week, that's what it was originally called because all the emphasis was on the great things that God did in these three days in the life of Jesus and that he continues to do now in the life of his disciples. He bring them, brings them through suffering and death to resurrection, new life. Now, I imagine there are very few people who would balk at the offer of resurrection and what it means, even on a short-term basis. But it's the idea of suffering and death being part and parcel of the process that puts them off. And in a way, it's understandable. Even for seasoned disciples, the mystery of suffering and its place in the great scheme of things is puzzling, and it can be easily misunderstood and misapplied in our own lives and in our relations with others. Remember, Peter himself tried to remonstrate when Jesus first mentioned uh, rejection and suffering and dying that lay around the corner and said, don't be daft, Lord, we'll fix that. And Jesus' reaction was fairly extreme. Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle in my path. In other words, you're stopping me, or you would stop me, bringing life to people and people to life. And the word used for obstacle is scandal on. In that book, Emiliana Law introduces an image for Lent of the church as a ship. It's coming into port after a long, arduous time at sea. So it's time for a bit of an overhaul of rest, restoring weary timbers as well as weary limbs and spirits. And that image of a ship uh, can be found even already in the pages of the Gospels. Remember the disciples caught in the boat on the Lake of Galilee by a sudden squall with Jesus asleep there in the stern. And that relationship, a symbolism of the uh, church as a ship has been recognised in the traditional uh, architecture of our churches. The main body of the church is called the nave, from the Latin word navis, which means ship. And of course we can easily identify the storms that have rocked the church over the centuries. Um, storms which have originated at times from outside the church but which can, as we've seen too often recently, can rise from within the church. So we all need to take time to rest. I remember during a retreat uh, for priests once, the priest director recalled um, a car that he had received at the time of his ordination from a friend, and the friend had written, you will do great things for God. And he said, you know, I believe that. And now, he said, looking back over my life as a priest, I can't believe I was so naive. I realise now that it's God who can and will do great things in and through me, if only I let him. The same advice was given by another retreat uh, priest. Uh, he was a bishop, an Irish bishop, I can't remember his name. But he spoke about the need for the church, for all of us, to shift our focus from the work of the Lord to the Lord of the work. We can get so caught up in the work of the Lord, become over busy, get into everything in the parish, we become good servants and we neglect the Lord of the work. We need to find time to be with him for he's looking not for servants but for friends. So it's good to be reminded of the value of rest and to have the opportunity during Lent for rest because life can 
become ever more frantic and frenetic. Um, so it's good to be still and to know that Jesus is with us and he is God and to take stock on a relationship with him. Already the book of Genesis had recognised the importance of rest um, with the seventh day in chapter 1 of Genesis, the rest, the day of rest, Shabbat, from the hectic activity of ongoing creativity. That day would become holy for God's people. Holy means set apart uh, from the ordinary routines. But there's another word for rest in Hebrew, which also appears early in the Genesis story, in chapter 2, verse 15. Nuach, we're told God took man and settled him, Nuach, in the garden, to take care of it and cultivate it. God, in other words, settled man in, saw him comfortably settled at ease, rested, man can rest safe in God's presence and even in doing God's work and Genesis tells us that God would come down in the cool of the evening so they could rest in one another's company you might want to think of that as a sort of cocktail hour time for a sundowner time just to be together resting in one another that's what Lent is about resting in the Lord prepared to let him bring us with him through the daunting experience of these three days, trusting our, ourselves to him. He knows what he's doing. He's done it himself. We can trust him with our lives. But, you know, if we're honest, that's not how we normally approach Lent. It can become a time for getting busy, of doing something extra. And the big question then becomes, what are you doing for Lent? And people think up programmes or projects of self-denial. But the real question is what is Lent going to do for you? In a little book of 1991 entitled Feast for Lent, the celebrated British TV cook um, Delia Smith, who converted to Catholicism at the age of 22, wrote in her daily reflections on God's Word, what I have discovered is that God is actually waiting to be gracious. We need to grasp that self-denial is not a display of human muscle power. Look, I've given up alcohol, chocolate or whatever. God is not looking for a great show of human effort as proof of our love. What he wants is a chance to show the proof of his love. So it's good to be reminded, as the Second Vatican Council did, that the primary focus during Lent is not repentance or penance, it's baptism. It's because we are baptised as disciples that we are recalled year by year back to the font or if you're a candidate for the right of Christianization for adults for the first time to the font because the Lord wants to take a closer look at us and together take a look at how we're doing as disciples. The Lenten rest gives us an opportunity to gauge the level of our baptismal commitment to the Lord, which, if we're honest, at times has perhaps been non-existent and maybe at best half-hearted or mediocre. That's when we realise the need for repentance, for change, for a realignment, for a recognition that sin is about. Sin as as falling short, refusing the promptings of God, causing upset and hurt to others, and so discrediting the very notion of discipleship, that's when we ourselves become a scandal. So we need to ask ourselves, why do we sin so that we need repentance? Why do we let ourselves wander off course? In his book, Why Go to Church, the drama of the Eucharist, the, a former Master General of the Dominicans, Father Timothy Radcliffe, addresses that very question. And he recalls words of wisdom of a former friend and fellow Dominican, Father Herbert McCabe. 
Father Herbert wrote this, The root of all sin is fear, the very deep fear that we are nothing, hence the compulsion to make something of ourselves, to construct a self-flattering image of ourselves that we can worship, to believe in ourselves, our fantasy selves. To sin is always to construct an illusory self that we can admire instead of the real self that we can only love. Repentance is about abandoning that false, illusory self-image and starting to face the truth of my real self, the self that God loves and wants me also to love. That's what Jesus wants us to see, the truth that he sees when he looks at us, the good that lies hidden sometimes even from ourselves. He wants to uncover the truth and help us to realise the real me behind all the posturing and pretense. And that will become a major theme for St John in the fourth gospel. John's gospel is all about the extensive, comprehensive, all-embracing makeover of humanity undertaken by Jesus in the Incarnation, coming into the human predicament um, so as to restore it to its true um, and uh, real self. When Jesus entered human history, he entered into its very depth. He stripped away all the accumulated layers of lies and false news and misinformation that had grown up and conspired to blind God's people to the truth about God's world and their place in it and how to make it a good world. And like a master craftsman, he revealed that everything people need to have a meaningful uh, life has been replaced by false, cheap, second-hand replicas. Now he is offering the real McCoy, the true light and water and bread and shelter and protection and access to life's support system and freedom. And all of that will come from him. And then he goes further. He began the process of restoring the whole world and us to our original glory, lifting us up with him, as it were, to bring us back to the glory that should have been ours from the beginning. And it was all a work of love, of divine love, that is to be continued throughout history by disciples fired with that same love. And that's why on the cross for St John, the final words of Jesus are quite simple and direct. It is accomplished. It's done. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. John's not saying he just died. He's using the technical word for tradition. Jesus hands on the spirit to those waiting to receive it. At Calvary, the church in miniature, Mary and a beloved disciple, representing each and every one of us. The spirit who engineered and orchestrated his own personal makeover of, makeover of this world during his public life and ministry. And the spirit who will now help the church do the same for the future. Once and for all then, for St John, the truth is out in the open. That unique loving relationship, self-giving of the Father to the Son and the Son of the Father, the truth that has become accessible to us by the coming of Jesus and the sending of the Spirit. Jesus wants to draw us into that profound communion of life and love and truth that he had been party to before time began. And he wants us to enjoy the sheer bliss of it. And what's more, he wants us to enjoy it, not just in some distant future, 
but to have a taste of it even now in a Holy Communion with him and with one another. The testimony handed on to us through the letters and the written Gospels by that first generation of disciples has provided us with a reliable sounding board known technically as the canon, the rule of the scriptures. And there we can get in touch with the meaning that they found in the events, especially of this week, the meaning that helped them develop the daily life and mission of the small communities that were established as a network of faith and of generous self-giving uh, in the Middle East and that would develop into the full-blown universal church that we know today. Now, in this small reflection, uh, we haven't got time to, uh, or, or space to go into the whole of that testimony, so I've chosen to pick up one or two of the clues that St Luke has left us in his Gospel because during this year um, C of the, the church's liturgical calendar it's St Luke who has been providing us with a guide to Jesus and to the significance of all the events in Jesus's life. So on the second Sunday of Lent this year Luke gave us the key that would in fact open up for us the meaning that he had found underlying the whole events, uh, especially of that Holy Week, that Great Week. The Gospel of the Second Sunday describes that occasion when Jesus took Peter and James and John up the mountain to share with them a unique experience, a, 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 an insight into his person and his own mission in life what we call the transfiguration. He let his glory, as it were, break out. Now, Matthew and Mark also give us an account of that event. But what's significant for Luke is that he tells us exactly what um, Jesus was speaking about when Moses and Elijah appeared on the scene. In chapter 9, verse 31, he says, they were talking of his passing which he was to accomplish in Jerusalem. And the word Luke's, in Greek that Luke uses for passing is exodus. Now the word is charged with meaning. It conjures up that great event described in the book of Exodus, the passing over of a people from slavery to freedom, from being a group of unrelated desert tribes, nobodies, to becoming one people, God's people. And it was all God's doing. And that experience would be woven into the consciousness of this people and would be recalled and immortalised in the yearly celebration of the Passover feast. That exodus originally would take a long time, 40 years, and would involve a difficult journeying through the wilderness but it would have a happy ending. And that's what Jesus wanted the disciples to appreciate as he was about to reveal the journey that lay ahead, not just for him, but for everyone who walks in his footsteps. He wants them to know, that despite everything, there's a happy ending. The medieval hermit Julian of Norwich underlined that in her little book, The Showing of Divine Love. She says this, God never promised that you would not be travailed. We Scots would put it fairrocht or hardrocht. What he did say was you will not be overwhelmed. All will be well, all will be well, and all sorts of things will be well. That's the promise. And that's what Jesus wanted them to catch a glimpse off on the mountain. And so, a few verses later on, in the same chapter, 9, Luke tells us, Now as the time drew near for him to be taken up to heaven, he set his face resolutely for Jerusalem. He faced into the jaws of suffering and death. And then there follows, in St Luke's Gospel, nine chapters which 
Luke is designed as a sort of self-contained unit. You could actually take them out and staple them and use them as a little sort of vademecum, you know, like a pocket book of discipleship for everyone who will set out on that journey in the footsteps of Jesus, even though Jerusalem uh, had been destroyed in the year 70 AD, um, because it's not the actual city, uh, it's what Jerusalem represented for St Luke um, for every generation. Rejection, suffering, death, but also resurrection. And so these chapters contain the observations and advice that Jesus personally would give to every disciple, would want them uh, to know about. He was familiar with the whole route, the pitfalls and all. So Luke's intention is clear. Find the key in the Exodus tradition. Now, obviously a deep detailed analysis of the Exodus is beyond us here. But what I would like to do is just call your attention to one or two little details that are significant in themselves. When you open the book of Exodus, chapter 1, the situation that faces you is one that we're very familiar with. It stresses one of oppression, um, of human misery, of hopelessness. Here are a group of slaves, victims of a totalitarian system, and they have nowhere and nobody to turn to, not even God. Verse 23 tells us the sons of Israel cried out, groaning in their slavery, and from the depths of their slavery their cry came up to God. It doesn't say they cried out to God. It does say God heard their groaning. The cry came up to God. God is attuned to human suffering. A simple point, but so important. It is God who's going to take the initiative, make the first move, and what triggers off that move and escalates into the full-blown engagement by God in human history is precisely human misery, meaningless existence, hopelessness. It's all anathema to him. It's an affront that prompts him to get personally involved. And so he approaches Moses. And, of course, Moses' first reaction. Do I know you? Who are you? Give me your name. Are you one of the great Egyptian gods? Or what's more important, are you up to a confrontation with the great Egyptian gods? So Moses is looking for some guarantees. He's bargaining with God. He's trying to get some control of the situation, get the measure of him. Well, there's nothing new in that. We know from personal experience that we sometimes do the same sort of thing. We try to uh, take the same t tack with God and uh, uh, summon him to our side as and when we need him. St Augustine um, wisely re reminded us, si comprehendis Deum non est Deus. If you think you've grasped God, then what it is you've grasped isn't God. God is beyond our grasp. We can't summon him up with a click of our fingers or even with the frequency or intensity or length of our prayers. And so God replies to Moses, I am who I am. Now, that does seem a bit abrupt, as if God were saying, mind your own business, or even mind your manners. It certainly wasn't very helpful. But I came across a suggestion by a South American uh, biblical scholar that you can act actually translate the Hebrew words there Eye, asher, eye, in two other different but significant little ways. First of all, think of God saying, it's me. And that has a completely different ring to it. And it resonates easily with our own personal experience. Think of the last time as a parent you heard a child cry out in pain or anxiety, wakening in the night, frightened, or falling outside, skinning their knee, and there's a bit of blood, but they see it as 
you know, life draining. And they cry out and you recognise their cry and you rush to them. You don't hold them at arm's length and say, be quiet. It's Jean or it's Jimmy. No, you hold them close. You shh. You whisper in their ear. It's me. It's me. I'm here. And that's what God is saying to Moses. He's inviting us to trust him and just to let him hold us. It's a relationship of faith, not proof, hard fact. We will know him in our very needing of him. And if we actually want to look for God and his whereabouts, then we're more likely to find him close to where there's human misery. And a second little way of translating those three words, yeah, yeah, is I'm me. You know how often we've had to say that to other people when they try to make us see things from their perspective or do things their way and there's no arguing with them and your only resort is finally to say, oh, look, I'm me and let me be me. Trust me. The wilderness experience that God led them through would become a constant theme in subsequent theological and spiritual reflection on the impact of God in human history and it gives us the pattern of faith of trusting in God the journey towards freedom and to the mature life enhancing exercise of that freedom requires a high degree of trust of self-knowledge and humility years ago I came across a little book by Francis Dorff, a Norbertine priest called The Art of Passing Over, An Invitation to Living Creatively. And that's really what we all look for and that's what Exodus is all about. And that was the basis for his book and for his work as a priest. And he spells out that life is in fact a series uh, of journeys, a constant going further and further but he's able to identify for us three significant steps or stages in every exodus every passing over um, a rite of passage that we ha have to experience in life he says first of all you will have to face painful endings the realization that Whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever um, the, the, the circumstances of your life, you're going nowhere. There has to be a change, whether it's a change of job or a change of location or a new responsibility. Whatever it is, you can't go on the way you've been. Something needs to go and letting go in faith is always difficult but there is a decision to be made and once you've made that decision you find yourself in that position that is awkward it's called the awkward in-betweens you're on unfamiliar territory territory you're in new circumstances with you don't know what dangers lurking around the next corner um, you don't know where you're going, uh, you're hungry and thirsty for meaning, just like the people were in that great first journey through the wilderness. And they were tempted, like we're sometimes tempted, to go back. It wasn't really all that bad, was it? And they began to think on the cucumbers and the garlic and the onions and the pans of meat that were so available in Egypt. They would have sold their souls for an onion. And the thing is, there's no end to that period of awkwardness. Um, you can't orchestrate it for yourself. You've just got to keep going, hoping. And so it's all just a question of letting go and being in hope. But then he says, one day you will imperceptibly perhaps realize that it's not all dark there's a bit of dawn a brightness on the horizon um, a lightness in your step 
and you begin to realise that you're moving into the third stage. Awesome beginnings, new opportunities and possibilities, a new life is dawning. And that's inviting you to let go in love. And that pattern, the Exodus pattern, is the pattern of human creative living. And that's the pattern uh, that Jesus lived through definitively for all of us. And at the end, the promised end is a glorious ending. You know, there's an old saying, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You can talk to your heart's content about these three special days and how they can help you make a sense, uh, not just of Holy Week, but of your own life. But there's, there are no substitute words for the experience itself. So you need to give the treasure a try and give God a chance and jump in. Let him prove himself. I'd like to finish, um, if you'll excuse me, I know I'm just a few minutes over, with a, a, a little image that I came across in a book published in 1964 by the Swiss theologian Hans von uh, Urs von Balthasar. And he talks about what lies deep at the heart of every human life and indeed uh, is the key to understanding what human history is all about. And he takes us to Shakespeare, who uses a little literary device often, but especially to great effect in the play Hamlet, uh, to uh, get his point across. He says the play, the big play of Hamlet, is all about uh, Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, uh, brooding over the murder of his father, the king, by his uncle, Claudius. And then Claudius has gone and married his mother, the queen, um, Gertrude. But nobody can prove it. And everybody's going about as if all was normal and they don't uh, face the true state of things. And then suddenly a group of strolling players turns up at the castle and Hamlet gets an idea and he hatches a plot he gives the players directions and words to put on a little play and he calls it the mouse trap because he says the play is the thing with the, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. And of course it works. They put on the play that night for the whole court and Claudius says no, he gets the message when the, the mummers, the players go through the motions of poisoning the king and he leaves the room aghast and white in the face. But the thing is, the little play within the play has been the key. It has allowed everybody's eyes to be opened. They've seen the truth of what's really going on. And Balthasar, von Balthasar wants us to look at that little play within the play when we look at the three days of Holy Week, the Paschal Mystery that we celebrate at every Eucharist. And that's what Jesus is drawing us to become part of uh, and to involve ourselves in and to experience with him. And that has helped me realise um, something important, that when we gather to celebrate the Eucharist and what we will do over the three days of the Paschal Mystery is not some little hole in the corner ritual made up because we want to, as Catholics, remember Jesus. It's not superstition or make-belief as some of the reformers wanted to suggest, you know, in the 17th century, calling it hocus-pocus, you know. Uh, a parody of the words of consecration, hoc est denim corpus meum, this is my body. No, what's going on is the celebration of the Paschal mystery, the triumphant um, passageway through every suffering and dying, but emerging into new life. And that is what the church is called to be, to live that mystery in such a way as it becomes a sign to the world, an effective sign, a sacrament of what God is making possible for everyone. Next week, or in the next talk, 
we'll zoom in a little closer. God bless.